Okay, so let's um, move on to the next talk, which is me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I will be talking about some exciting latest updates about Thundercar's consensus protocol. This is joint work with Yue and Rafael. The problem we are going to try to solve throughout the talk is called state machine replication. It's also called blockchain or consensus, and in this talk, they all mean the same thing. Uh, we have a set of Ethereum nodes in this example, and these nodes are trying to agree on a linearly ordered log of transactions. There are two important security properties that we care about, namely consistency and liveness. Consistency says that all of the honest nodes must have the same view of the log, right? Maybe your, your network can be a little faster than mine, and your log progresses a little bit faster. That's fine, but at the end of the day, we have to have the same view. Liveness says whenever I buy coffee, this transaction has to enter all of the honest lo notes logs fairly quickly. It's not like I want to wait forever for my coffee. So now if all of these notes were honest, then the problem would have been trivial. What's challenging and exciting about this problem is when some of these notes can be compromised. Let's say they have malware. And and these corrupt nodes can behave arbitrarily. They don't have to follow the honest protocol. And even under such adversarial conditions, we want to make sure that the remaining set of honest nodes still satisfy these two important security properties. So this is the problem we are going to try to solve. And the plan is the following. Uh, first, I will uh, quickly describe Thunderella, which is uh, Thundercar's consensus protocol. This is a you know, high performance and decentralized consensus protocol. Uh, in fact, in last year's expo, I also talked about um, our car consensus protocol. So therefore today, I want to focus on a second part, which is more exciting. When our engineers were implementing the protocol, they pointed out what seems to be an alarming flaw in the protocol, which is kind of puzzling in the beginning because we had painstakingly written 74 pages of proofs mathematical proofs for the protocol. So how can you know, we um, have the proofs on one hand, but then have this you know, uh, flaw? As it turns out, our proof was perfectly correct. And the flaw was actually in the underlying synchronous model, which is the model that people have been using to study consensus for the past 30 years. And we, we are... Um, saying that this model is not a good model, uh, and then I'm going to basically talk about how to um, fix both the model and the protocol. So let's start with the first part, Thunderella. Uh, here's the Thunderella consensus protocol. It's very simple. Um, in this scenario, we have the guy in the center. I'm going to call this guy a leader or proposer, and we have a committee of voters. I'm going to assume that the leader and the committee have all been elected, let's say through a stake distribution. Here's a very simple protocol, it's voting based. The proposer is going to make a proposal, right? He proposes a block, and the block is packed with the sequence number. So the sequence number is going to decide where in this very long log this block is going to reside. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to make a simplifying assumption. I'm going to pretend we confirm one transaction at a time instead of one block at a time. Now, when the voters receive the proposal, they will vote. A vote is basically a signature on the proposal. If you are honest, you are going to vote on whatever proposal you receive. In this case, the proposer proposed an orange block. So if you are honest, you would be casting an orange vote. Uh, and remember, Loki is corrupt, so he is casting two blue votes instead. Now we wait. We wait until we hear three quarters of the committee vote on the same transaction. And at this moment, we have enough confidence because many people believe in this transaction, we are ready to confirm it. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to refer to a collection of three quarters votes, a notarization. So when you see a notarization, the transaction is confirmed. The most important thing to remember about this protocol is that honest nodes are going to vote uniquely at every sequence number. This means at every sequence number, I'm going to wait until I hear the first proposal from the leader and I'm going to vote on this proposal and only this proposal, nothing else. And with this important invariant, I can give you an extremely simple consistency proof. And the proof works as follows. In this scenario, 
both the blue transaction and the orange transaction, they're both notarized. And I want to prove that they're the same transaction. And I'm going to make the assumption that uh, the set of corrupt notes is minority, less than half. Let's look at the set of blue notes who have voted for the blue transaction and the set of orange notes who have voted for the orange transaction. And the claim is that the intersection of these two sets must be large. In fact, the intersection must contain at least a half of the notes. And if the adversary controls less than half, it means there must be an honest guy in this intersection. So now remember what I've said about honest guys, right? They are going to vote uniquely at every sequence number. And this means there is only one explanation that the blue is equal to the orange, right? Because this guy in the middle, the honest guy in the middle voted for both. It has to be the same one. That's the consistency proof. So now we can reflect on what this very simple protocol buys us. Um, first, I've proved to you that whenever the voters are honest majority, we can achieve consistency. In particular, what is important here is that consistency doesn't rely on the leader being honest. Notice that in my proof, I never use the fact that the leader has to be honest. The proof only relies on the fact that honest nodes vote uniquely. Um, and for liveness, we have to assume something stronger. We, we need to assume that not only are three quarters of the committee honest and online, we also need that the leader must be honest and online too. And that's a little bit unfortunate because if this ben benevolent dictator of liveness is not so benevolent after all, then the world can come to a stop. Like for instance, if the leader crashes or if the leader makes different proposals to different nodes, then you know, if, if he goes to sleep, obviously there's no liveness. If he proposes different things to different nodes, everyone will end up voting for different things and nothing will collect a notarization. So in order for the protocol to be really decentralized, we want to remove this um, guy that we have to trust for liveness and we want to achieve both consistency and liveness under this weaker set of condition, the yellow condition. How do we do this? And the idea behind Thunderella is very simple. So the very simple voting protocol, let's call that the fast path. And let's imagine there's a separate slow chain, right? And you can think of this as Ethereum, but it can also be a proof of st stake slow chain. Now the slow chain satisfies consistency and liveness under honest majority. Like it can be honest majority in computing power or in, in stake. Uh, and if the fast path ever fails, the slow chain is still there, so people can still use the slow chain to reach consensus, and they can use the slow chain to discuss how to rebootstrap the fast path, like how to switch to the next proposal. Um, very simple idea, and the nice thing about this approach is that it achieves both performance and decentralization, because almost all the time, you should be operating on the fast path, and you see the performance of the fast path almost all the time, but the protocol is just as decentralized as the slow chain is. Okay. So now I will describe how this fallback mechanism is done because this actually matters to the alleged flaw I'm going to talk about in the second part of the talk. I only have to describe two things. One is how to detect fast path failure and second, how to do the fallback. Uh, for detection, we have a very simple heart beating mechanism. Imagine every now and then, the committee will take a cryptographic hash of the fast path log and they will sign the hash. When the hash gains uh, votes from uh, three quarters of the committee, it becomes notarized, and this notarized hash is called a heartbeat. So a heartbeat serves two purposes. Number one, it's a keep alive mechanism. Number two, it's a cryptographic checkpoint of the fast path log. The hash binds to a prefix of the fast path log. Under normal circumstances, the heartbeats should keep beating, right? If at some point, I see k blocks go by without a single heartbeat. Uh, let's say k is like some kind of security parameter. Then something has to be wrong. Like either maybe the leader has crashed and the fast path has uh, stopped. Or maybe the leader is uh, malicious. He's trying to censor certain transactions. And the committee aren't happy with the leader. So the committee stopped voting uh, to rat the leader out. In either case, we want to do the fallback. How do we do the fallback? It's also very simple, but it's like just slightly subtle. We already have consistency at every position in the log, but at the moment when people want to fall back, they don't have consistency over the length of the fast path log yet. Like in this example, Spider-Man's network is a little slower. When he wants to fall back, he sees three notarized transactions on the fast path, whereas Iron Man sees six. So now these two guys have to uh, use the slow chain 
to reach agreement on the length of the fast path lock. And, and the way it works is if I've seen a notarized transaction on the fast path and I want the fallback to pick up this transaction, I am responsible for posting this notarized transaction to the slow chain during the fallback period, which is green in this picture. In fact, you don't have to do it for all of the fast path transactions. You only have to do it since the last checkpoint. Right? Remember, the heartbeat mechanism serves as a periodic uh, checkpoint mechanism. OK, so in this way, you know, we can reach agreement on the, on the length of the fast path lock. And what's nice here is that liveness no longer relies on the central guy. Uh, we achieve both consistency and liveness under the weaker set of condition. And under the stronger set of condition, we now have fast. And almost all the time in practice, you should be operating in this or orange um, region. OK, just to quickly summarize, Thunderella is a very simple paradigm. Uh, when things are good, we have a single round of voting to confirm each transaction. And when things are not so good, we just use the slow chain to fall back and to maybe rebootstrap the fast path. And you know, the talk may make it seem very simple, but the paper is quite um, painful to write because we had to write all these like 74 pages of mathematical proofs. Uh, I won't try to go over the proof, but I want to talk about the more exciting part. You know, what is this um, mysterious flaw in Thunderella? And importantly, as I said, it's not a flaw with the proof, it's a flaw with the, this 30-year-old model. Okay, so I'm going to describe a scenario. And in this scenario, the interesting thing is that everyone's benign and no one has malicious intent. And yet, if just a few nodes crash in a specific timing pattern, uh, a confirmed transaction can get undone. Okay, so here's the scenario. It's like the same as before. And the only change here is that one of the voters is Coinbase. Okay, so proposer makes a proposal. Everyone votes. The proposer is going to collect a notarization and send the notarization to Coinbase. At this point, Coinbase is the only guy who has seen the notarization. No one else has seen the notarization yet. So Coinbase believes this transaction to be confirmed. Um, but unfortunately, at this moment, the leader crashes. Like maybe the leader is under DDoS. He's out of the picture. Coinbase happily tells Dan Bonet, you know, the transaction is confirmed. Dan ships the car. He waits. At this very moment, Coinbase, unfortunately, also crashes. Maybe Coinbase is also under DDoS. Uh, so what's going to happen now, because the leader is out of the picture, everyone's going to fall back, right? Because the fast path will stop. And when you fall back, everyone's going to post the notarized transactions they have seen to the slow chain. And um, of course, Coinbase is unaware that it's under DDoS. He's going to try to post Dan's transaction to the slow chain too, but he's disconnected. After some time, maybe Coinbase has fixed the network problem. It's back online, but it's already too late. People have moved on. The fallback is over. This confirmed transaction now is undone. And then we'll be sad face. <laughs> so therefore, we have this flaw. We have the mathematical proof, but we have this you know, seemingly um, alarming flaw. Right? This is not what a secure consensus protocol should do. And as I said, the flaw is not with the proof. The proof's perfectly correct. It's with this 30-year-old model with which we study consensus. And let me elaborate. So Thunderella is proven secure in a model called the synchronous model. What's synchronous model? Uh, in a synchronous network, whenever an honest node sends a message, the message will be delivered in a bounded amount of time. And the protocol is aware of this delay. So whatever the delay is, we can call it one round. And that is, if honest node sends a message, the message will arrive at other honest nodes at the beginning of the next round. In our example, Coinbase had a short-term outage. This means he violated the network assumption. And you know, in the classical synchronous model, the guy is doomed because the model would treat Coinbase as faulty from this moment on. And you know, a classical synchronous consensus protocol is not obligated to provide any security guarantee for faulty nodes. And in this case, you know, Coinbase is inconsistent, but the, the, it doesn't violate the proof, right? That's why the paradox. So at this moment, you are going to say to me, Elaine, you know, you're not saying anything new here. 
This is exactly why we have the partial synchronous model. Uh, in this talk, partial synchrony is the same as synchron uh, a asynchrony and partial synchrony. Uh, I'm going to uh, treat them in the same way. In the partially synchronous model, message delay is arbitrary, and the protocol needs to guarantee consistency no matter how long the narrow delay is. And the protocol doesn't know the narrow delay. And um, now, in the case of Coinbase, it had a short-term outage, and this is just the same as a long narrow delay in the partially synchronous model. So he's, he's going to be fine, right? When he comes back online, he's going to continue enjoy, enjoying consistency and liveness. Uh, and now you may think, so partially synchronous should be a strictly better model, right? Why do we even care about synchronous? Well, there is a catch. In fact, partially synchronous protocols, they're unrobust in a different way because there is a well-known law bound that says any partially synchronous protocol cannot hope to tolerate more than one-third corruption. Whereas if you worked with synchronous, you can tolerate up to minority corruption. And in fact, if you don't care about the round complexity of the protocol, you can tolerate arbitrarily many corruptions. So now we seem to be at a dead end. Like we have to pick, this seems to be an inherent trade-off. We have to be pick, we have to pick either to be unrobust in this way or in the other way. Um, and what do we do here? We don't want to give up, so we want to ask, can we achieve the best of both worlds? Uh, and given the classical kind of insights we have, the answer should be no. But if you think about it a little bit longer, perhaps this is not a hopeless case, because who says synchrony is a binary attribute? Like who says the network has to be either synchronous or not synchronous at all? And who says partition tolerance has to be a binary attribute? Like who says a protocol has to be either partition tolerant or not partition tolerant at all, right? So by the way, Partially synchronous protocols are said to be partition tolerant. Okay, uh, and this is what we will try to do. We will try to quantify exactly how synchronous the network is and how part partition tolerant the protocol is. And we will need a new model to do this. I will describe the most natural and simple model. This model is overly restrictive, so at the end I will quickly describe how to relax the strong assumptions we make. Imagine there's the set of green nodes and these are the nodes who are both honest and online and have a good network connection. Like all of these nodes can talk to each other uh, within a single round. Uh, let, let's imagine these guys are in California, they have nice weather, you know, the cellular network works great when you have good weather. And, but we have these gray nodes and these are the honest people in Boston. It's snowing in Boston, so the cellular network is uh, frozen, so it's like slower. So these guys have an unstable network connection. And then there's the corrupt guys uh, we don't care about achieving anything for the corrupt guys, but we do want to make sure the green guys and the gray guys can reach consensus. I mean, of course, when the gray guys are offline, they cannot make progress, but it should be the case that when, whenever they come back online, they should continue to make progress, and, and they should always have consistency regardless. So can we achieve consensus for the green guys and the gray guys is the question. Uh, well, it turns out if you want to achieve this, you have to make some assumptions, right? If the set of green nodes is less than a half, we can prove a lower bound to show that this is impossible. The lower bound is not difficult, but I don't want to go into the details. Uh, this lower bound is also tight because in fact, if the green set is large, you have many people who are honest on and online, more than half, then indeed we can reach consensus for both the green nodes and the, the gray nodes. Okay, so we call this kind of protocol best, partition toler best possible partition tolerance. And the reason is because we are indeed making some timing assumption about the network, right? We are assuming there's um, majority people who are honest and have good network connection. And yet we keep in mind, you know, sometimes the minority of people, they're still honest, but they can have an unstable connection. And we don't want to penalize those great guys. So that's kind of the model, but actually um, what I've said so far is overly restrictive because I've assumed that this green set is persistently online throughout the entire protocol. And as we all know, protocols like Bitcoin, they run for 10 years. And no one can guarantee persistent uptime for 10 years. Like even Gmail has outage every couple of years or something. So it could be that during the life cycle of the protocol, every honest node is at some point offline. So we want to kind of relax the model by requiring not requiring these green guys to be persistently online throughout. 
Instead, we actually work with what I like to call uh, the lazy co-author model. Uh, you know, imagine these cryptographers, they want to write a paper together and send it to the next crypto conference. Cryptographers, maybe some of them are lazy, they're not always available. Some people are online on Monday, some are online on Tuesday. And you know, when you are online and you send a message, and the online people in the future can receive your message, but when you're offline, there's no guarantee at all for the messages you send and receive. So these people, they want to make sure they can you know, finish the paper before the deadline, but more importantly, they want to make sure everyone's proving the same theorem. It cannot be like at the end of the day, you know, everyone discovers we have different theorems in mind. Okay, so I, I won't um, dive into the details of the mathematical model. Instead, I want to quickly talk about how to fix the Thunderella protocol to be best possible partition tolerant. The fix actually consists of two parts, how to fix the fast path and the fallback, and how to fix the slow chain. In this talk, I will only have time to talk about how to fix the fast path. I won't have time to talk about how to fix the slow chain at all. The fast path fix is actually extremely simple. Earlier, we said whenever I see a notarization, I confirm the transaction. And now, you just have to be a little bit more patient. Uh, you will wait until the next transaction is notarized too. And at this moment, you chop off the last notarized transaction and the entire prefix is considered to be confirmed. Okay, and why are we doing this? The reason is the following. If I see a notarization, the only thing I'm sure of is many honest nodes have voted for this transaction but now if I'm a little bit more patient, I, I wait for the next transaction to be notarized too. Now I have higher confidence, right? Imagine honest nodes will only vote for a transaction when the parent block is also notarized. And if many people have voted for the next transaction, it means many people have seen the parent notarized. So now if um, unfortunately, you know, I happen to crash, that's okay because many other online people have also seen the notariz notarization of the parent and they will be online to post this notarization to the slow chain in case a fallback happens. You can formalize this intuition into a formal mathematically rigorous proof. I won't try to do that. Um, what I talked about is actually just the tip of the iceberg. We actually have a systematic study of this model uh, from the theoretical underpinnings to practical protocol design. We have a couple papers online on ePrint. If you want to learn about the full spectrum, you'll have to read the papers online. Um, and in fact, we not only apply this model to consensus, we also apply it to multi-party computation because there the concern is, you know, if these honest guys, they just happen to drop off, uh, drop off line, uh, they shouldn't have to sacrifice their privacy. Okay, I'm going to try to um, wrap up by making a couple of philosophical observations. So first, um, the set of best possible partition tolerant protocols is actually a strict subset of what's classically known as synchronous honest majority protocols. And the way to understand this is the following. We are a refinement of classical synchrony. We give you a way to tease out exactly which subset of synchronous protocols enjoy the robustness properties we care about in practice. That is the white set. And the important thing is, it's not like any natural classical synchronous protocol would automatically fall into the white set. And in fact, it's quite the contrary because we looked at a bunch of existing classical synchronous honest majority protocols. It turns out none of them belong to this more robust set. So what this means is if you have a blockchain company, right, if you want to de deploy a synchronous consensus protocol, if you don't have a proof, you shouldn't be able to sleep at all. If you do have a proof, but the proof is in the classical synchronous model, that's a little bit better, but it's not good enough. You really want to be in this white set. Okay, lastly, I haven't mentioned the fact that there actually exists the black set in the classical synchronous model we know that we can tolerate corrupt majority, right? So, which is very nice, you know, we can tolerate arbitrarily many corrupt nodes. Unfortunately, we show that if you want to tolerate corrupt majority, you have to sacrifice partition tolerance. The white set and the black set, they're completely disjoint. 
And, and if you reflect upon this, what this is saying is that maybe the classical synchronous model isn't a best match for the robustness properties we care about in practice. Because if you worked with classical synchrony, you would be misled to think that tolerating more corruptions is always like strictly better than tolerating fewer. But in fact, from the examples I've described today, I hope I've convinced you that actually in practice, you always want to be in the white set rather than the black. Okay. Well, just um, an announcement, like we have very recently launched a pre-release version of our mainnet. Uh, you should check back for more updates, including our new product roadmap and, and other things. Thank you all so much. Did you want to do any questions? We have time for like, <laughs> we've got time for like, yeah, a few. Does the heartbeat that, that the notarization, why does it have to be a heartbeat? Why can't a node says, says I'm, I'm about to vote on the fast path, I'm gonna quickly vote, initiate a vote on the slow path. So it's not, it's, it's almost like, like in, in ethernet carrier detection, you do a random wait and then you, and then you broadcast. So in this case, you do a random wait uh, and, and then do a, a voting on the, on the uh, slow path. I'm, I'm actually not quite sure um, that I understand the modification you are suggesting. Maybe, maybe if you want, we so, can so, take so it So wh why do you have to have a periodic heartbeat? Why does it have to be periodic on a fixed, uh, there are two fixed length or fixed period? There, there are two purposes. One is a periodic checkpoint. Like if, yeah. if your transaction is incorporated into a heartbeat, which is posted on the slow chain, you'll have higher assurance. Okay. And the second reason is, we need, to, we need a mechanism to detect fast path failure. Like how do the uh, fast path, the committee even know the fast path has stopped, right? There needs to be a detection and, mechanism. And, and, and what situation would actually force you to do too many heartbeats that becomes inefficient? The, the heartbeats are really tiny, like it's um, just a hash. The size is fixed, it's independent of the- Of the length. The, this, but uh, you have the to do it, right? Length of the lock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so like most of the time, like we, the only thing we post to the slow chain are the heartbeats. Like the, tra the transactions on the fast path don't get incorporated on, on the slow chain at all. So that's why we can achieve high bandwidth, high yeah. throughput. Yeah. 